Good afternoon. My name is Jim Townsend, and I am the director of the Levin Center at Wayne Law. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion entitled Best Practices for Election Audits, which we are co-hosting with the Voting Rights and Election Law Society here at Wayne State University Law School. I want to thank our co-sponsors and note the vision and leadership, really, of the people who conceived this event. Uh, they are Stephen Nelson, who's the founding president uh, of the Voting Rights and Election Law uh, Society, Ann Calder Burgum, and Domenico, Domenica Convertino, who are respectively the incoming president and vice president of the society. Collectively, they have made this event possible. It is no secret that we live in a time of diminished faith in the core institutions of our democracy, and that you know, this situation poses an existential threat to the American experiment in democratic self-government. Today's discussion focuses on a topic that, you know, prior to about a year and a half ago, very few of us would have considered important, but now we realize is essential. And that is the administration of election audits. How such audits can be used to enhance voter confidence in our elections and the integrity of those elections. And what steps should we take to strengthen oversight of our elections going forward? For those unfamiliar with the Levin Center, our mission is to promote and advance bipartisan fact-based oversight and civil discourse as instruments of change. Uh, since 2015, when the late Senator Carl Levin established the center here at Wayne State University Law School, we have pursued that mission through trainings and workshops in Congress and state legislatures, convenings, uh, commentary in the media and in the courts, and through research and scholarship. Today's panel is one of a series of events that the Levin Center is sponsoring to explore various mechanisms of transparency and accountability in our public institutions and the steps we need to safeguard and strengthen our democracy. You can learn more about our work by visiting our website, levin-center.org. Uh, you can join one of our listservs or you can follow us on social media. So with that, I would now like again to thank the president of the Voting Rights and Election Law Society, Stephen Nelson, and turn things over to him for some opening remarks. Stephen? Thank you, Jim. Uh, as, he, as Jim noted, I'm Stephen Nelson. I'm a student at Wayne Law and uh, founding president of the Voting Rights and Election Law Society. So as Jim mentioned, today we are talking about election audits. Uh, before 2020, election audits were rarely a point of news coverage, uh, let alone a story receiving national coverage for weeks or even months. But with the exception of January 6th, election audits may be the most lasting story of the 2020 election. Despite substantial coverage, the purpose and the aim of election audits remain murky for many Americans. This lack of clarity is likely connected to the newness of the topic in the national news and the unfamiliarity with its purpose. With elected positions in the United States numbering in the hundreds of thousands, citizens have frequent opportunities to hear about the election process when one of their races is inevitably extremely close. Drawn out or delayed counts are not uncommon, as we saw here in Detroit in the 2020 election. People have seen these before, and the purpose is easy to understand. Recounts similarly occur frequently enough that citizens understand the purpose and the basics of the mechanisms. But 18 months after the election, 2020 audits are still a point of contention and are still poorly understood by most. What this means for 2022 and future elections remains to be seen. But our guest today will help us to understand what audits are and what they should be. Notably, a recent joint report co-authored by our speakers organizations, along with Protect Democracy, highlighted five components of proper audits that have not been met to varying degrees in five states that undertook audits following the 2020 election. These, compo these components include that audits must be conducted transparently, objectively, comprehensively, competently, and securely. So here to help us understand the current state of election audits are two guests. Derek Tisler serves as counsel in the Brennan Center for Justice's Democracy Program. His work focuses on issues related to election administration, security, and disinformation. He is a co-author of several recent reports at the Brennan Center, including election officials under attack in 2021, 
how to fix the New York City Board of Elections, also in 2021, and ensuring safe elections in 2020. He is a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. Matt Germer is a resident elections fellow for the governance program at the R Street Institute. Before joining R Street, Matt was a policy counsel and strategic planning coordinator at Washington State House of Representatives. There, he drafted legislation, developed policy proposals, and offered strategic counsel on a variety of legislative matters, including elections, in addition to taxes, energy, criminal justice, and technology. He is a graduate of the University of California, Irvine School of Law. Our conversation, as noted, will be mentioned, will be moderated by Calder Burgum, incoming president of the Voting Rights and Election Law Society. Questions may be asked, and we encourage them, by the audience throughout the conversation in the Q&A. Questions will be monitored throughout by Dominica Convertino, incoming vice president, and where helpful for, for clarity, she may put these forward during the conversation, but most will be left, at, left for a dedicated Q&A session at the end before we conclude the event. So with that, I would like to say thank you to Derek and Matthew for joining us today, and I will hand off to Calder. Thank you, Steve, and, and thanks so much, Jim, as well, for those uh, introductions. Um, and then a big thank you one more time to, to Matt and Derek for being here. We, we really appreciate uh, your, your taking the time. I think Steve did a great job of laying out what the issue is here. Uh, election audits have been in the news, but at the same time, a, a lot of folks still don't quite understand what they are, uh, what their purpose is. So Matt, if, if I could start with you, uh, just, just really the basics. What, what is an election audit? Um, how, does it, how does it vary from, say, a recount like, like Steve brought up? Sure. And first, I want to start by saying thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure to, to speak to you as part of this group. And um, I'm very impressed that the students at Wayne have put together a voting rights and election law society. Um, that's something we didn't have on my law school campus. And, and I really now feel like it was a missed opportunity. So I'm glad that the students have come together to create that. And uh, thank you to the Levin Center for, for helping to host this event as well. Um, to get to your question about what is an election audit, I guess to kind of keep it short answer, there are, there are a couple of different types of audits, uh, but the ones most people think of are commonly referred to as a post-election audit. And these are checks to make sure that the equipment and procedures that are used to count the votes during an election worked properly and that the election itself yielded an outcome that's trustworthy. Um, we can think of a recount as being a type of audit, I guess. Uh, it, it's perhaps the most expansive form of an audit going back and recounting all of the ballots, but uh, we don't usually think of those as being an audit. An audit tends to be more narrow in focus, um, ensuring that uh, the count itself is trustworthy. I will note as well, in addition to uh, those audits that make sure the election itself was trustworthy, there's a separate category of, of audits uh, and they often get conflated uh, with the first category I mentioned. And, and these are procedural audits. It's not entirely a, a question of whether or not the count was accurate, but whether the right steps were followed uh, in conducting the election. Um, very often, those don't come back until well after the election is over, and they are used to inform election administrators, lawmakers, uh, about ways to improve the process in the future. Uh, and occasionally, I mean, for, for years, those kinds of, of audits have gone under the radar, uh, although with current times, they've received more attention because they do occasionally expose opportunities for improvement. And for people who are looking for ways to undercut the trust of an election, uh, those kinds of procedural audits are now gaining a lot more attention. So uh, hopefully that's a, a quick overview of what an election audit looks like. For sure, it's, it's very helpful. I, you mentioned there's with these procedural audits, it's it's really looking at the whole process rather than just necessarily an outcome. And so, Derek, when we're when we're looking at the the process, how do election audit fits fit in with other election security and transparency measures? Where do they fit in in the timeline? Um, and and in the in the grand scheme of things, what are different components in that process uh, that fit in to ensure that our our elections are secure and, and transparent? Yeah, so, uh, you know, first, I just want to uh, echo, echo Matthew's, you know, thank you for putting on this event on a, uh, a very overlooked topic for a long time, uh, a very important one. Um, and I think a, a topic where, you know, this sort of clarity and discussion uh, is more important than ever. Um, so, you know, as, as, uh, as Matt kind of explained in talking about an overview of audits, these are uh, a very routine part of the process. Um, and I, I think audits are really 
emblematic of what so much of election administration really involves day to day, which is kind of just the tedious checking and double checking of, you know, records, materials, equipment, just constantly making sure everything is working the way that it should be, given uh, really how great of a logistical challenge running an election really is. You know, across the country, it's something that involves tens of thousands of individuals who all have a hand in making sure that everyone can cast a ballot and have their vote counted. Um, and so, you know, for a long time, there have been these procedures in place at every single step of the election cycle before voters are casting their ballots and then after the ballots are counted. Um, so, you know, kind of going through some of those steps. Um, one is that election officials are constantly monitoring uh, and maintaining voter registration rolls, uh, making sure that, you know, it is only eligible voters who are able to cast the ballot. Um, before each election, workers conduct uh, what's called logic and accuracy testing on voting machines, um, which in some ways is kind of the, the flip side of the post-election audits that we're talking about. This is before the ballots go into them. Are they counting everything correctly, right? You can feed in sample ballots, make sure everything is read properly. After they do read the votes, you do the post-election audit again on the backside. Just make sure all the equipment is working properly. Um, officials are, you know, through every process before and after sort of maintaining these rigorous chain of custody procedures for ballots, materials, equipment, everything that's moving from, you know, polling place to election office into the hands of various workers. There's always a need for a record to know, you know, where is everything at every step, who has access to it. Um, and any other important information to just know what is happening at all times. Um, and then after election, typically even before audits take place, there's a whole canvassing process that again, just involves checking, double checking, triple checking ballots and records. Um, and then sometimes, uh, as you talked about, there's also recounts, um, which sort of confirm that vote totals are accurate in a different process than audits. Um, so all of these, really work hand in hand together to just make sure, um, again, everything is working as it should be from beginning to end every single election. Is that a, is that a pretty standardized process? Because, you know, one thing we saw and that we'll talk to late, talk about later is that we saw challenges happening at different levels. So you, you might have like a, a county uh, that was being challenged specifically, or it might have been more of a, a state effort to, to push for an audit. How, how standardized is it uh, across, across states or across different uh, levels of government? Yeah, I think anytime you talk about election administration in America, uh, you do always have to think about it as 50 different election <laughs> systems. Um, you know, I, I feel like every time I get a question of like, how does this work in election administration? The response is always, it depends, <laughs> you know, what state are you looking at? Uh, but that being said, we see these sort of best practices that have been uh, developed and defined over time that you really do see from state to state. Um, pretty much all the procedures that I just mentioned, they may vary a little bit in terms of um, who is the official responsible for carrying out act each activity, at what step in the timeline does it take place? Um, you know, sometimes audits can take place before certification of results sometimes afterward. Um, but I, I think you tend to see uh, these same procedures overall when you go from state to state. All right, and, and yeah, please. Well, if I can uh, chip in just for a second to mention, you ask about how audits fit in with other security procedures that are out there. Um, and one thing I just wanted to, to briefly mention, we often hear about this conflict between voting access and voting secure or, or ballot security. Um, I, I often dispute that those two things are always in tension, but I do want to note that within the world of audits, there could actually even be a conflict between some security measures and the ability to audit. And, and I, uh, I don't mean to undercut any kind of quality of auditing, but more like the, se the secret ballot itself can often make it difficult to ensure an accurate count. Um, if someone might have, you know, uh, intended to vote for, for person A, but the ballot itself, for whatever reason, was difficult for a machine to read or for a human eye to read, you can't go find them and say, hey, who did you intend to vote for? Um, we have procedures in place that are meant for security and that we want to respect. 
uh, but that can play a role in ensuring an accurate count. Uh, it, it's often overlooked how many ballots uh, are undervoted, so that's no, no the, the person maybe intended to vote but forgot to mark uh, a candidate for a certain office, or overvoted and accidentally voted for both candidates or for many candidates and, and their ballot was rejected. Uh, and for good reason, we have a secret ballot and, and we shouldn't be getting rid of that, but it does uh, present certain obstacles in the course of ensuring that the outcome was as the voters intended. Um, they're, they're edge cases, but I thought it was, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about is policymakers are out there uh, contemplating additional security measures. Uh, often that can, that can lead to conflicts with things like uh, ensuring an accurate count in an audit. Yeah, when you brought up that example, um, Bush, you know, Bush v. Gore came to mind and, and what voters intended to you know, with their votes in, in Florida and the, the hanging chads and all that. Were there have there been changes in the in the last 20 years or so? Um, you know, how have legislators struck that balance? Has changing technology played a role or or is it just kind of a conflict that we're we're stuck with? That's that's the way it is. Uh, technology has played a substantial role. And in fact, even looking at the Florida elections, to me, they're a great example. That's a state that had that became famous two decades ago for the fiasco that was the 2000 election. Um, since that time, Florida, well, I'll, I'll pause. As of 2020, Florida was one of the best election systems in the country. Uh, they have since decided to make modifications to their system that I, I would argue have pushed them in the wrong direction. But um, they still represent a very high quality election within the court, within the, the scope of the country uh, in large in, in no small part because of procedural changes that they made, uh, as well as the advancing technology that I think back then the, the whole thing around hanging chads is because they were using punch machines to mark a ballot. And if the if the uh, uh, punch didn't go all the way through you end up with a dimple or a hanging chad uh, that was ambiguous or, or could be ambiguous. Um, we now have optical scanning technology that allows machines to quickly count ballots based on marks of a pen. Uh, and, and if there's disputes, you can you know, bring in human eyeballs to check. We don't really have the, the physical limitations that were in place with those machines uh, in Florida in the past. Uh, so technology has helped, uh, procedural updates have helped. And uh, Florida has also put in place, I think some great processes to make ballot counting more efficient, which allows for better quality counts. And, and the best example I, I think of for that is that they will start pre-processing absentee by mail ballots in advance of the election. It doesn't mean they necessarily start counting them and releasing results, but it does mean they take that envelope, they make sure that it was signed properly, uh, they make sure that, they're, uh, that the process was followed as best they can in it, before running the count. Um, that allows for an opportunity to cure ballots if there's mistakes uh, in advance. And in a state like Florida, where my, my memory is about a third of voters vote in person on election day, about a third of voters vote in person in advance of election day, and about a third of voters vote by mail, uh, they were able to turn around results in 2020 faster than so many other battleground states because they did that kind of pre-processing work. And uh, you know, can compare that maybe famously to Pennsylvania, where they weren't allowed to touch their ballots until election day, and that delay led to the kind of conspiracy theories that, that we've heard of um, and really slowed things down. So yeah, it's a combination of technology and improved processes that that really helped. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, you, you kind of mentioned where sometimes there can be these different values and tension um, about, you know, accurately reflecting someone's vote um, and some of these security concerns. I think there's an area where this, this changing technology that we've seen uh, since 2000, um, these have really worked in parallel, hand in hand, um, especially the movement to better designed hand marked paper ballots, mm -hmm. um, much easier for, uh, you know, judges or workers, whoever it is to determine the voters intent than some of these ballots that were used in Florida 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, uh, you know, I think there's really been this increased focus on the importance of these paper ballots for election security. Um, and this is sort of where audits come in, because just having the paper record of somebody's vote, that only gets you halfway there. <laughs> what you need to do afterwards is have these processes for routine, routinely examining those paper records after every election, make sure that they're lining up with what the machines are saying. And so that's really what we're talking about when we talk about post-election audits. And in, in terms of who is actually carrying out, out the audits, you mentioned 50 different states, 50 different systems in a lot of ways. I know here in Michigan, we're one of the least centralized election systems in, in the country. 
Um, is it is it city and county level people carrying out the audits? Is it generally handled by states? Who, who are we talking about when we you know, talk about election audits? Yeah, I think it's very much as always varies from state to state, uh, but you tend to see state and local officials working hand in hand on these sort of things. Um, often these sort of guidance standards oversight come from the state level mm -hmm. uh, with local officials doing the actual work of um, you know, organizing workers to hand count those ballots, um, determine which ballots need to be sampled, that sort of thing. Um, so we, we, we definitely see it uh, working similar in every state that conducts post-election audits, uh, which at this point, the vast majority do so. Um, there are a few different methods in place for conducting those audits, um, but that's what, how we tend to see these work. All right. And before we get into what happened in, in 2020, um, man, I just want to ask you, what are the general goals? What are, we, what are we trying to accomplish just at a high level so we know where things might have gone wrong in, in 2020 with, with some of the states that had the, the partisan audits? Yeah, so at a higher level even than what you may be going for, uh, audits are about trust in the system and about ensuring that the elections that we hold are worthy of public trust, that their outcomes uh, reflect the will of the people. Uh, it, you know, I think it's always important to remember that a hundred percent accuracy in all circumstances is is a uh, fool's errand. Again, because of the overcounting, undercounting, things that are ambiguous, uh, it's very difficult to promise that it should be a hundred percent. And and even beyond that, you might have voters voting at the wrong address when they just recently moved, or as I believe happened in Michigan, they found some cases of someone casting a ballot in advance of the election and dying between that time and the day of the election. And different states handled that differently. I think in Michigan, those ballots are not supposed to be counted. So 100% accuracy is extremely difficult. It can't, doesn't mean it isn't done, particularly at precinct and county levels, but um, the audit is about making sure the process was trustworthy. Uh, and, and then if, it, if there are opportunities to improve into the future to identify what those opportunities are and essentially lay them out for auditors, for local officials and for state lawmakers to refine their process to create an even more trustworthy election going forward. So, you know, thinking about those goals, now I want to dive into some specific examples of, of what happened with the, the last elections when audits did become the story. Uh, the, the Brennan Center and R Street published a, a joint report. Uh, I believe it's been put in the chat. I highly recommend folks check it out. Uh, it provides both a great overview of audits, some of the stuff we've already been talking about, but then also gives detailed case studies in, in five different states that uh, is very helpful. Um, one of the states discussed in the report is was Michigan. Um, so uh, Derek, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you. Uh, could you briefly describe the, the findings in the report? Yeah, so this report was really, um, you know, attempt to take a step back and explain what these sort of uh, well-designed election audits based in you know, statistical rigor, based in best practices, and really designed to talk about the goals um, that we've discussed, uh, what do those look like? Um, and we felt it was more important than ever because there was this, this whole wave of things <laughs> that were being called audits um, and everyone was just using this term audit to the point where it, it kind of felt like it was meaningless. Um, and it was certainly difficult for anyone to tell who, you know, didn't necessarily uh, follow post elections prior to 2020. Um, as, as much fun as I think they are, uh, I can understand where they may be a little tedious and boring uh, for, for some other people. Um, so we kind of came up with a set of objective criteria that could be used to examine different efforts. Um, and we identified five of, uh, five of those standards, um, those being uh, transparency. Um, you need to be able to include the public, show your work that you're actually following the procedure set in place. Um, objectivity, um, it should be ran and overseen by actors who don't have a stake in the outcome of it or don't have a predetermined idea of what the election is going or the audit is going to find. Um, there needs to be pre-written comprehensive procedures. Um, I think this is kind of an obvious one. If you think about you know, a, a sporting event or something, you would never want the refs just making up the rules in the middle of the game. Uh, everybody needs to understand exactly what it is that you're setting out to do. 
uh, there needs to be competence in the people involved. Um, again, elections are complicated um, and the people who work on these uh, are really professionals <laughs> in election administration. Um, and it's so easy to think that something went wrong when really you just don't understand the processes that are in place. Uh, and then the last thing is they need to be secure. Um, and I think the biggest thing that we're talking about here is maintaining rigorous chain of custody over all the ballots, equipment, materials that go through this process. Um, again, making sure that uh, only authorized people have access to those materials and you know where they're at at all times. Um, and so we evaluated some of the uh, current efforts that were taking place in the aftermath of 2020 using these criteria uh, and really tried to get at where we thought that these efforts fell short um, and where uh, they weren't designed to achieve the sort of goals that audits are designed to achieve. Um, and we sort of use the term uh, partisan election review to design to define these sort of efforts that fell short. And I think that gets at, you know, the political goals that motivated these efforts in so many cases. Uh, Matt, you were listed as one of the, the authors on the report. Um, in, in the research, was there anything that really jumped out at you? Uh, you, you know, you've I've been studying this for a while. Were there, were there any surprises or any any really key takeaways that you'd want to highlight now? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll mention um, for folks that don't follow audits, I mean, they should be boring. I, I often think about the, uh, there's a, a series of characters on the TV show Parks and Recreation that were all of Ben Wyatt's uh, accounting friends. And like everyone is just extremely bored by them. And that's largely what, how auditing should feel. It takes a special type of person and God love them, we need them. But the kind of person that, that wants to get engaged in those levels of details, um, unfortunately for so many of these audits and, or partisan reviews, as I think is a fair way to describe them, um, they had a predetermined bias coming into it saying, I know something went wrong, now I'm going to go find it. Uh, and that is not the correct approach to take toward uh, reviewing an election in a true auditing uh, fashion. And you know, I think maybe most famously, the, the audit in Arizona of Maricopa County conducted by uh, the Cyber Ninjas, uh, may they rest in peace, uh, is you know, maybe the most emblematic example of uh, what really wasn't an audit. Uh, there was not nothing standard about it. It wasn't being conducted by professionals. They were not secure in the way that they handled ballots. You know, there was no transparency because there was no process. Um, and it was very difficult for the public to really know what was going on, although they did a fair job of making themselves open to to interviews with all sorts of people, which was, uh, you know, at least entertaining, if nothing else. Um, and so that kind of that kind of audit really sh shone a new light on what was going on across the country, but it wasn't the only state. Uh, and as Derek mentioned, we looked at five states. I think it was Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Um, and, and even more has happened since the time that that report was published last summer. And, and you know, I think the other maybe most famous story is the is the audit process or review process in Wisconsin and a recent memo that came out making the argument that you could undo the entire 2020 election and that there's grounds for that. Um, the entire thing was incredibly frustrating for folks who've been following elections for a while. Uh, and uh, it was the kind of thing that that, you know, really makes you question whether or not the people behind it are trying to uncover truth or they're trying to uncover a very particular outcome. And in the meanwhile, shredding faith in, in a fundamental democratic institution. You, you, you brought up, um, you know, the, the group that's a blank on it, cyber ninjas, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, in Arizona, when you talk about private organizations conducting these audits, is there a world where having a, a private organization come in and do these works or or should this be is this a public issue and it should stay in, in public hands how do you view that issue so i'll say and, and you know maybe for your audience if they're not too terribly familiar with r street as an organization um we are a, a center right think tank you know we come at things from a free market limited government perspective i am not generally opposed to the private sector being involved in in government oversight comma, to some extent, I think there's an appropriate time when that can be useful. And if you've got experienced contractors who can come in and, and who know how to do an audit, who themselves are not invested in the outcome of the audit, um, th then there are appropriate times. And, and this is why we have various accreditation services 
uh, for auditing. It's why it's, it should be important for public officials to review the credentials of those that they are hiring to do an audit. Uh, and that that process of hiring contractors should be transparent to the public. And, and a number of states have very robust public contracting uh, rules in place to ensure that that's the case. Um, so yeah, I mean, I do think that there is a world in which private actors can step in and do this. But at the end of the day, it, it is a uh, public process. Elections are one of the fundamental um, uh, services, I guess, that our government needs to provide. You know, even for someone as myself who, who is comfortable maybe with less government uh, intervention in different forms of our of our society, uh, you know, there are obvious things where they need to exist and where no other party is equipped to do it, whether it's police or fire or emergency services and, and military services, elections are in that same category. It's the kind of thing that uh, that a government a democracy must do and must pay for uh, and, and, and make sure that it's done at a level that's worthy of trust. And, and when it comes to these audits, the government is the one who needs to be establishing what the standards are uh, well in advance of, of the actual audit uh, and, and maintain kind of that, that oversight over the contractors they're hiring. But um, the concern here that we saw across the country is, is folks hiring people who weren't equipped to do the audits, who didn't have a record of any kind of election auditing in their background, uh, who at best may have had a law enforcement history. But you know I, I bet if you asked an auditor whether they were equipped to do law enforcement, they would laugh. Uh, and I think there's a similar response you might get from them if you ask them if they thought a law enforcement officer was well equipped, equipped to do an election audit. Um, they're, they're just two different branches of, of work. Uh, and so that, I think, in my view, is largely some of the major concerns of what we saw. Yeah, I, um, I agree with all of that. And, you know, I would just add to that uh, private companies being involved in election administration is, is nothing new at all. There are private companies involved that basically every step of the process from, uh, you know, designing and maintaining voter registration systems to, you know, building the voting systems that show up in polling places, helping to service and maintain those things. Uh, they, you know, design and sell electronic poll books. They design software that's used to uh, report results on election night. Um, so there's always this, this involvement and obviously this need for um, you know, additional support, resources, expertise that can come from, uh, you know, some of these companies. The difference between that and what we saw with, with companies like Cyber Ninjas is, again, they are, they're vetted, they're qualified, um, and everything that they do is uh, according to the rules and standards that are set by, you know, election officials and public officials more broadly and always under the oversight of those officials. Um, and so I think that is really the critical point um, is you, you can't just be turning over everything to these actors who have no idea <laughs> what they're doing, are getting funds from hidden sources, uh, are, are not prepared to maintain rigorous security protocols. Um, and again, are going into this entire process um, having this predetermined idea of what it is that they want to find at the end of the day. Can you dive into what it means to have someone that doesn't know what they're doing? What, what does that mean? How, what are some of the specific things that happened that diverged from standard practices for audits that if an outsider is reading about these, these efforts, they could say, oh, you know, that specific thing, that, that kind of veered off course from what should be happening. Were, were there specific examples of of differences from from standard practices that you have? Yeah, I, you know, I think one of the the earliest red flags that came up when the Maricopa County uh, review started up um, was the color of pens that were being used to to mark ballots as as uh, these these volunteers were reviewing them. Uh, this is the type of thing that most people have just never thought about, but election officials have definitely thought about who do this work over and over. Uh, the best practice is to use a red pen uh, because it won't show up on a scanner. It won't get counted as a vote and you wouldn't accidentally count it as the voters marking as you're reviewing the voters intent. Um, so that's just one of those little things that there are best practices that have been developed and tested over and over every single election. But if you're not involved with election administration, you would have never even thought of. Um, another example was the, the process by which volunteers were reviewing ballots. They were on these little 
uh, turntables um, where essentially there'd be a ballot on like two or three sides of it and they would just get spun around the table <laughs> as people have seconds to try to identify the marking on it and jot it down. Uh, and then at the end of the day, the people reviewing the same ballots didn't even have to totally agree on what the count was. They built in, I think it was a 3% error rate, um, which means you're just gonna have all these little errors that build up over time and can accumulate to something that is incredibly misleading at the end of the day. Um, so I think those are the, the examples where, you know, in many cases, I think some of their, their findings that turned out to be misleading at best and outright lies at worst, they could have been avoided by just communicating with those election officials and saying like, is this correct? This looks off to us. Can you explain this? And they would have been able to explain it in the time instead of trying to explain later by releasing separate reports. Um, but there, there was never any intent to do that because <laughs> there really wasn't the purpose behind the review that they were conducting. Um, again, they were determined to find something at the end of the day. So looking forward with, with these audits, um, Matt, what would you say the result has been? Um, and do you have any concern that the problem is gonna get worse with 2022 coming up and obviously 2024? Uh, what, what are we looking forward to here? Yeah, uh, I have become maybe too cynical over the last few years. Um, you know, I'm one of those people back in, in 2015 who had a very confident view about the way that elections work in America. And over the last six years, I have learned uh, how misplaced that confidence was. Um, I will say that my, my major concern is, is twofold. One is that the folks who engaged in these um, audits, you know, in certain circumstances, I think in Michigan, uh, I, I'm Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing a county name. Is it Macomb County? Uh, that Macomb, Macomb uh, that that conducted, I believe, their own auditors. I think they hired some actual accredited auditors to do the work and found that there really was no tampering with the machines and that the result was was accurate. Um, and I think the same, you know, similarly that in Michigan, the, uh, the Senate Oversight Committee did, did their own review as well, and and as I recall, found nothing of concern. So, you know, I, I have on the one hand, I'm concerned that. Um, uh, voters, candidates, politicians, people with a vested political interest still haven't necessarily accepted um, the outcome of many of these reviews that were done well and that, you know, didn't find malfeasance. Uh, and so we might hear from them again, uh, pushing very similar conspiracy theories. Um, I'm also concerned about the potential for a bit of a tit for tat relationship that depending on how 2022 works out or 2024 works out, um, that since the process was challenged from one direction, we might see it challenged from the other direction. Um, you know, and it, it's hard to uh, assume that that will necessarily be the case, but you know, we've always seen this continuing escalation in our politics that if one side says, you know, I think we need to do X, the other side says we need to do X plus one when it's their turn in response. Um, I don't want that to be the case. I'd like everyone to kind of go back to making audits boring again. Uh, but that is, that is, uh, where I stand at the moment, but the optimistic side of me, I said I've been cynical, the optimistic side of me thinks that um, uh, voters themselves are starting to kind of get tired of these, these arguments as well. And we're starting to finally see some, like no one is ever excited about exhausted voters, uh, but I kind of see a little bit of a silver lining with voters finally just getting over it all. Uh, and that maybe there won't be as much juice for politicians kind of seeking that populist fervor around election challenges. Um, but maybe that uh, maybe that's just looking for rainbows in a hurricane. Like I might, <laughs> we may not be through this thing yet. Yeah, yeah. I definitely. Uh, I I feel like you know I'm constantly seeing uh, press releases or statements or bills introduced that make me have to double check the calendar and confirm that we are we are two years away from the 2020 election. Uh, but it feels like that election is never going to end, um, and there is just this this endless stream to revisit that election uh, and then put in place these similar processes in the future. Um, these types of partisan reviews that can take place with, you know, little justification needed that can be raised by almost any person, <laughs> you know, we've seen bills introduced that are sort of a citizen initiative type thing where anyone who says, oh, this looks funny, uh, can demand that an audit take place. Um, so uh, I, I certainly share the, the cynicism um, 
And, uh, you know, I, I expect that these tactics will certainly continue in the near future. If I can add one more thing, I think it's, uh, I'm not only trying to pay attention to people who are making a call for an audit or who are even arguing that something nefarious happened. Um, but beyond that, there's always a question of remedy. You know, I guess, you know, for the law students in the crowd, uh, that's something they may they may have yet to cover if they haven't hit the two L and three L years yet and signed up for remedies. You should. It's a, it's a great class. Um, but what are you expecting to get out of this? Is the idea that you will be proven correct and you will you know sleep better at night, or are you expecting the entire election to be overturned and for your preferred candidate to be declared a winner, uh, which is, is not even on the table? Um, even if even if you think that the election itself was was broken, that elections aren't resolved by having the second place candidate be declared the winner. Um, that's not what we do. And in fact, I think of, of examples of when real vote fraud has taken place. Uh, I live out in North Carolina and, and there have been documented uh, instances of voter fraud. And the result is often just another election. You, you run it again. Um, so there's also this element of what are you expecting? Uh, is that expectation even plausible? Uh, and, and even then, it's, and holding another national election for president in itself was not ever really on the table. But I think there's an important question about um, not just what is being done in the audit and not even that why you're conducting the audit, but what you expect to get out of the entire process. And, and there hasn't been a lot of honesty, I think, from the actors who are pushing for these things around that point. So I want to turn to, to remedies in a different sense, uh, solutions, how we can kind of fix things going forward. Um, before we get into what those might be. I, I want to talk about the, the players here. Um, who, who are we talking about when we, we say we want to improve these systems? Are we reaching out to legislators? Do we need to push the secretar secretaries of state? Is it county election officials? All of the above. Um, who, who are the players that we're looking at here? Uh, and I'll, 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 yeah, Matt. I'll I'm happy it. to take that. So my, my background is working in, in, in state government. Um, I worked at the Washington State House of Representatives for uh, four years, and I staffed the committee that covered election policy. Uh, and that is in, in most states where a good bulk of the work is done as far as establishing auditing rules and procedures for the entire state. Uh, as Derek mentioned earlier, I think a vast majority of states have established post-election audit procedures statewide. Uh, I think there's maybe a dozen states that are still needing that, and that's a place to start. Um, what, what I do expect to see is uh, additional state legislative activity on this front. But to your question about who's involved, it is a team effort. State legislators aren't experts in this. Uh, they might all consider themselves experts in elections uh, as they all got elected, but they aren't necessarily experts in electoral process and election administration. Uh, and so they rely upon whether it's secretaries of state, if that's what the state uses to oversee their elections or whoever the chief elections officer is in the state, uh, but also local county officials. Um, you know, Derek mentioned again that, that we have 50 elections across uh, the country, we, but we have even more than that, really. I mean, elections are largely carried out at the local level. Uh, and so when it comes time to make changes to electoral processes or make changes to the auditing procedure, uh, that involves substantial input from those who are on the ground, whether they're on the ground conducting the audit or on the ground actually conducting the election. Uh, and so for those who are interested in this subject matter, it really is an all of the above approach. Um, even the political parties themselves have a role to play as part of this process. They help, often help to pick out election observers who will go and watch over uh, the count on, on election night. Um, and I would encourage everyone out there, if you have an interest in this, sign up if you can. If your jurisdiction allows for you know, volunteers to be election observers, go do it. Um, you might be more bored than you think, but that's a good thing. We need people who have, who have uh, uh, the ability to withstand that. But um, it's a healthy part of the process and it's uh, a great place to start if you are interested in kind of working on electoral oversight. Derek, when we're talking about the, the solutions we should be reaching out with, um, is there, well, one, should we be pushing for legislative solutions, would you say, or is it mostly just discretionary things that you know, Secretary of State and, and uh, election officials should be pushing for? Um, so if you, could, if you could speak between that legislative or just, you know, shoring up processes that are already within those uh, those folks control, but then also what those changes should be in your mind. Yeah, you know, I, I just completely agree that it's a team effort. Uh, so everyone is involved in ensuring that these audits can take place, that they're successful. Um, you know, as I said, I think the state and local election officials themselves are best suited to actually carrying out the audit, audit with, um, you know, appropriate measures built in place for 
transparency for observation, as Matt mentioned, all of that. Um, and I think the, the legislature's best role is um, kind of supporting the process, like making sure that those officials have the authority that they need, the guidance that they need, the tools that they need, and the resources that they need. Um, elections in general are a very resource intensive process, takes a lot of money, a lot of people, a lot of equipment. Um, and conducting a, a true rigorous audit um, also takes significant resources. Um, and anytime you, um, you're, you're not willing to give that sort of support, those resources, you're opening the door for you know, a greater likelihood of errors. Um, if there are overworked, uh, exhausted staff, they're more likely to make a mistake somewhere in the process. Um, so I, I think uh, uh, accuracy is really dependent on that sort of investment. And I think legislatures are uh, best suited to getting those resources to the officials who need them. This, this event is uh, hosted by the, the Levin Center as well. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about legislative oversight. Um, is, there, is there a role for legislatures on that end, oversight of the election oversight, you know, election audit process? Yeah, I think they play a, a good role in particular in the, in the world of transparency. Um, and, you know, I, I guess it's really two things. One, they help to set the rules at a high level of, of when audits must be conducted, when their deadlines might be, what kinds of audits you're performing. Um, we're starting to see states experimenting with ideas like uh, risk limiting audits, which is a new form of auditing that, that uses some fancy statistics to determine confidence levels in, in the outcome. Um, I'm a big fan of the pilot projects going on. In fact, I think Michigan might already have a pilot program, program in place for that. Um, but that they also are a great place for the, the results of audits to be shared. Again, most people don't really pay attention to hearings uh, in their state legislatures, but there's very often uh, local media who's there to help keep an ear on things um, and, and other local kind of activists and plugged in people. And having auditors show up and present uh, a presentation on their, on their findings and say, you know, the election went great for A, B, and C reasons. We could use a little more resources to accomplish D, and I'm going to suggest that we overhaul the rules on E because we could do things better um, accordingly. And, and the legislature really plays its best role on uh, bringing that to public attention. Uh, and so I think at, at a minimal level, even in states that maybe even don't have regular post-election audits, there is a value in hosting, you know, listening sessions and hearings on how the audits went and requiring reports to be turned back in. Uh, I guess I would also mention that uh, legislators separate maybe from audits specifically, they have the opportunity to set election policy. Uh, and that can include things like requiring paper ballots, uh, which really help with the auditing process. Uh, and that I think there are still a handful of states out there that are, that are slow on that front. Uh, and states that often don't really get a lot of attention in national media. And I, coming to mind is I think New Jersey that's still working on putting forward paper ballots and no one ever talks about that, but that is a problem that they need to resolve in the garden state. Uh, and that's a, that's a role for the legislature there to play. So uh, there's a lot to be done really at all levels, uh, but particularly as Derek mentioned in, in resourcing and staffing, these audits take training, uh, they take time, they take technology that's not free. Um, and the legislature are ultimately the ones who decide uh, how budgets get spent and their decisions on that front play a substantial role. So I wanna make sure we leave lots of time for questions, but I, I do wanna end uh, with one, I want to read a, a short portion of the report here in the conclusion that I, I thought really uh, brought all this together well, and then, and then get your, your final thoughts here before we hit questions. Uh, so you wrote, the, the partisan reviews of certified elections being pursued across the country, despite a host of evidence the results were fair and legitimate, represent more than a break from best practices in election administration. They are an existential threat to our democracy. So looking forward, um, I know you, you talked a little bit about your, your optimism and your, your pessimism, but if, if folks walk away with, with anything from, from this panel, uh, what, do you, what do you hope they, they take away? Uh, let's, let's start with uh, you, Derek. Yeah, so, you know, one thing that I, I would love people to talk away, take away is um, audits are good. <laughs> and I think that is something that is actually getting lost in, uh, you know, just some of the craziness that has happened after 2020. Um, as we talked about, most, the vast majority of states have various audit processes to confirm results. Um, and as Matt mentioned, these more procedural ones to just review things more generally and say, 
Uh, did we follow all the requirements? What worked? What didn't work? How can we serve voters better in the future? These are all great things, uh, and they should they should happen. Um, and importantly, and, and we pointed this out in the report, all of these states that we looked at where these partisan reviews uh, are taking place, all of these states did conduct audits. In many cases, they conducted several audits and those audits confirmed that they got the result correct, which is the most important thing uh, that um, an audit should be concerned with, uh, frankly. Did we get the outcome right? And audit after audit, review after review showed that they did get it right. Um, and, and so that's when, again, I think you you start to look at what is what is the goals motivating these partisan reviews that we're looking at. Um, and given the way they fall short of objective standards in so many areas, and given the way that they seem so determined to to find something. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, none of these reviews have actually challenged the the result of the election that they're examining. Um, I wouldn't put too much stock in them because again, they're methodologically flawed, uh, but they keep coming up with the answer that election officials got it right in the first place. But they keep finding, you know, enough what they call irregularities to to cast doubt and to uh, give something to these, you know, these activists and these political leaders who are demanding that something change in election administration, even if no change is necessary. Um, so that that's for me the the big takeaway um, to end on, I guess, a note of opt optimism um, is as much as we've seen this kind of increase in conspiracies and casting doubt on election administration. Um, I think in many ways there's been this uh, parallel and equal increase in enthusiasm and support for the democratic process. Um, you know, even in, in forums uh, like this, where we're really like talking about the nitty gritty of election administration in ways that I think people never paid attention to before. They never paid attention to the efforts that it takes place that uh, that it requires from so many people to run an election. Um, and there's a lot of people like reaching out and saying thank you to these <laughs> officials and wondering what they can do to uh, make their jobs better to help boost confidence in the democratic process. And so I, I think that is inspiring. Um, I hope that it's uh, kind of inspiring a new generation of leaders who will come into this election administration profession, uh, keep making this process stronger for voters in the future. Um, and at the end of the day, sort of wins out over this uh, separate conspiracy driven trend that we're seeing. That's all great. And, and I, I will I will add a couple things maybe at a um, different level. Uh, one, I would say for folks, especially if they're not familiar with following election audits, um, there's the, the adage of Hanlon's razor that like never attribute to malice that would, should be otherwise explained by, by stupidity. I think stupidity might be a little harsh in this context, but human error, I think is fair to say. Uh, humans are involved in the counting of ballots. Um, and that means that we will have errors. Uh, it does not mean that every small error is indicative of a widespread problem. Uh, and it's also should be should be pointed out that we have had moments in, in history and particularly in 2020 where human errors uh, resulted in funny results and then they were found. In fact, our auditing procedures worked uh, and, and the, the error checks we had in place found those bad numbers. They were corrected and the results were affirmed. Um, so that's one thing I would say is if you're the kind of person who thinks that there's necessarily a conspiracy around every corner, Remember that even though politics, you know, often functions as a zero sum game um, and that it's tempting to to assume that every small indicator is, is a sign of malice. Uh, it's often not. Um, I guess the next thing would be for folks who do have an interest in this. I'd once again want to encourage you to sign up to be an election observer if you can. Um, very often volunteers are needed. Um, and if you can't, you know, or if you don't have an interest in being an observer or if it requires a partisan allegiance that you don't you don't have. Um, various places as well, you know, always looking for volunteers to help actually work on election day. Um, and if you want to, you know, trust the results, be a part of it. Um, finally, on all of that, I'd say really on, on, well, across the country, we need to kind of get back to a healthy skepticism uh, when it comes to really a lot of our processes, but I guess in this case, elections. 
Uh, if you are someone who uh, who believes that that there were you know actors from from Venezuela that were tampering with our machines and changing the vote counts, uh, that is an unhealthy skepticism. Uh, on the other side, I think we've we've also encountered a bit of a a backlash to the to the conspiracies, which is a there's nothing wrong uh, perspective, and and I think that's that is not enough skepticism. And and I'll I'll bring this up just to say like. I'm a big supporter of voting by mail. I love voting from home because I love having my computer in front of me and, and being able to talk through my thoughts and um, not feeling like the pressure of the voting booth on a day with a line behind you and that feeling where you got to go. But at the same time, in, in various states, you know, signature matching is, is more of an art than a science uh, to make sure that those ballots were properly signed. Um, and if you come across in, you know, information that, that shows that signature matching is, um, you know, again, prone to human error, uh, you got to be able to come in and say, okay, yeah, I guess that is a thing. It doesn't mean that we necessarily have to throw the whole thing out, but we should be able to recognize where deficiencies in the process might exist so that we can improve upon them. Um, you know, no system is perfect. And if, if that's the case, then when presented with something, don't just immediately defend the system because I think you lose credibility with folks who are searching for truth. Uh, and if they hear you say something, then you'll, you'll miss that opportunity to speak out to them. So uh, I'd say on both sides, don't be overly skeptical and don't be underly skeptical. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And that, that really points to the importance of audits so that we're all kind of working off the same set of facts on what went right and what went wrong. Um, I appreciate both of you coming uh, to, to speak with me. I'm going to step off here and uh, Dominica will be hopping on. She's been monitoring the, the Q&A. Uh, folks have been active, but um, for me, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, here's Dominica, our incoming vice president of the voting rights and election law. Take it away, Dominica. Thank you, Calder. And thank you, Matt and Derek. And also thank you to everybody who has put wonderful and uh, very stimulating questions into the chat. I don't think we will have enough time to get through all of the questions in the chat, but I will try to merge some of them where possible. So one question that stood out to me, or rather two questions, is that one attendee said that they want to know how to make election audits boring again. And then alternatively, another person said that they want to challenge that notion that election audits should be made boring again, and that we should instead look to having state officials or election officials in general making election audits more accessible and exciting to the public. So we can start with Matt and then go to Derek, but what are your thoughts on that idea? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, I guess, with the second question. Uh, I mean, I'm going to be in a little flip when I'm saying election that audits should be boring, um, but in some sense they should, right? They should be predictable as far as the procedure that's being undergone. They should be um, run by people who are who are competent and who are trained, which means everyone knows what to expect. And I guess they should be boring in some sense, in that um, they shouldn't be, you know, overly glamorized for for what they are doing, because I think that unfairly builds expectations for the public about what what's going to come out of it. Um, but on the other end, I think transparency is great. And it's, in fact, it's, it's in large part the entire premise of the audit. Uh, an audit that's done in a non-transparent way and where the results aren't made clear to the public um, loses a lot of its value. Uh, and so I'd say in, in a similar sense uh, to the first part of the question, what can be done to make audits you know, maybe more boring again is um, for people who, you know, as best you can, hold your own legislators accountable. And, and this can be tough as well, but there's a certain element of hold your own side accountable. Um, we have kind of a world of negative partisanship. So if uh, someone stands up and says, my opponent is a liar, well, that, that opponent's allies are going to rally behind them because we want to you know, a, a, a bolster our own tribe. Uh, so to the extent that it's your own side and it's your own legislator who is overhyping expectations, who is, is who's spreading um, mistruths about what's going on, uh, I think there's a certain element of, of responsibility that that we as citizens have of holding them accountable, um, which can be difficult, but that's you know largely what it takes. And I think I think putting audits in the right context again is is maybe the best way to make them boring. Yeah, I can uh, you know I can take the more fun side of it of how to make uh, audits fun again. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I so I, I, it's funny I've been in the room for some of these uh, audit processes, um, and with the um, especially with the newer uh, risk limiting audit uh, procedures, there is often a little ceremony uh, where you roll uh, 20 di dice and they're like the type of dice you'd use for like Dungeons and Dragons, you know, they got like 12 digits on them uh, and you have different people and each one rolls a dice and that creates a random number, which is then used to generate a list of random ballots that you're going to review. 
uh, and that's about the most uh, fun aspect of an audit as it gets, I guess. It's a moment that feels like a game and people try to have fun with it. Um, so maybe more could do that, but, uh, but more seriously, um, I, I do think election officials should be talking about the procedures that they have in place to um, ensure that results are reliable. Um, you know, make those public, encourage people to show up at the events, watch what's happening. Um, put out, you know, clear explainers through, you know, social media or wherever it may be that you can uh, reach your audience of um, trying to put into clear words, look at all the things that we do to make sure that we're getting it right at the end of the day. Um, because I, I do think, you know, there's certainly a group of people who are just driven to find something wrong no matter what. Um, but then there are people who fall into that, uh, that healthy skepticism range that you talked about of just you know, elections are kind of confusing and, and the procedures aren't always well advertised. And so it's natural to kind of wonder, how do they know that they're getting this right? Um, so I, I would always encourage election officials, you know, be vocal about this, share what you're doing, encourage people to come in, watch and participate. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you both. And actually, Derek, to your most recent point, I think it perf perfectly transfers to the next question which is that given that election audits were so politicized in 2020, an audience member wanted to know how we can ensure that we have procedures in place that allow election audits to be taking place in a bipartisan or really even a nonpartisan matter. And so I know that you had mentioned that it's important for election officials to communicate effectively with the public, but what can those election officials do when there are other like politicians, other elected officials in, in other areas of the government who are actively sowing discord to undermine public trust in the process. Yeah, I think this is an area where it, it's important to like reach out and invite people into the process. Um, and this is a role, um, you know, at, where political parties themselves um, can, can play a really important role um, in terms of supplying these sort of observers, participating in the process, asking questions, making sure that, um, again, a, a good audit has pre-written comprehensive procedures and everyone should know the rules going into it. And it is completely healthy and a good thing for, um, you know, politicians, uh, political uh, parties, the media, whoever it may be to see what's going on, make sure those processes are followed, make sure that they're uh, getting to the right result at the end of the day. Um, and so I, I think that's an important thing. Um, this is something that we've seen from talking to voters, uh, looking at polling data, um, these sort of bipartisan processes um, when they are built into election administration, it, it helps people feel more confident that things are going right um, because they feel like they, you know, they have someone from their team in the room um, to, to just make sure that everything is going as described. Yeah, I'll just chip in quickly to say that um, I don't think it's possible to eliminate partisanship from elections. Um, they are an inherently partisan process. And, and in fact, in, in many ways, I, you know, despite Washington, President Washington's uh, uh, warnings against faction in his farewell address, they've, political parties have been a part of our country's history since the founding uh, and even before the founding. And so uh, that's largely why our government is structured the way that it is, is to balance powers against each other to create um, that kind of tension. And uh, I think similarly, when it comes to election oversight, that a smart policy is the kind that, that recognizes that, that this tension exists and accounts for it. This is why election observers shouldn't be expected to be nonpartisan. It can be very valuable to have an established Democrat and an established Republican both in the room to watch. Uh, and for states that have things like ballot drop boxes for, for absentee votes, um, having two-person teams, go pick them up. Uh, and, and those kinds of processes, um, you know, very often if, you, if you've spent time on the ground with folks doing that work, you'll find that they might be looking for their, you know, their side's opportunity to gain advantage, but uh, they also uh, generally aren't looking for opportunities to like cheat. They're just uh, look, wanna make sure that the process was done correctly. Uh, and I think harnessing those um, rival intent uh, and recognizing it actually creates a healthier system. I love those points. I think that's wonderful. And, and I do agree that if we are to deny that this is an inherently partisan process that that might further uh, create distrust among the public for the process. So I appreciate both of those perspectives. 
So to that point, really, another audience member has asked what the role of the federal government is in this process and what the role should be. Is there a way that the federal government does get involved or should get involved in ensuring that states implement effective election audits? And we can start with Matt for this and then go to Derek. So I think the federal government plays um, some role uh, when it comes to elections um, more broadly. Uh, and, and as far as, it, as election oversight and auditing, um, you know, there's an opportunity to provide resources um, through federal budget making um, to ensure that the states are capable of doing this. But there's also a, an element of, you know, each state's election systems are different. So there's only so much that the federal government can do to um, uh, establish standardized auditing procedures. But um, I think that the that you know my, based on my experience, priority number one as far as federal involvement is concerned should be resourcing. Um, two could be things around you know accreditation or certification or establishing best practices and getting those publicized and out there um, because very often what can help tamp down. Um, tensions in the moment is being able to point to a third party's set of standards. The federal government's obviously not the most trustworthy example of that all the time, but um, uh, you know it, it, it's a common tactic in negotiations to say instead of my th my version versus your version, you say can we agree on a third party's version? Um, so providing kind of established best practices in advance from the federal government is is something they can do. Um, you know, again, I mentioned I kind of come from a from a limited government perspective, and I, I am a big fan of the fact that our elections are held at the state level. So I'm a little bit wary about too much federal oversight on this. Um, but I like dollars, and I think they can be really useful. So, <laughs> yeah, I would, uh, you know, say I'm a little more open to the federal government's involvement uh, in elections, but uh, I think we agree on on what would be the most helpful thing. And, and number one, it is dollars. Um, elections are expensive and they've been underfunded for a long time um, and they only continue to get more complicated more involved as time goes on as uh, technology becomes a bigger part of the election administration process as we see election officials needing to wear more hats than what they used to so they don't just have to be an, an expert on elections they need to be a cybersecurity expert and a logistics expert and a communication expert and Last year or two years ago, they had to be health experts and you never know what hat they're going to need to put on next. So there's always room for more resources, more guidance, sharing of best practices. Um, because elections are so decentralized in America, it, it can be tough, tough for these um, you know, best practices to spread throughout the country. And I think the federal government could play a great role in sort of um, aggregating those standards, making use of its expertise at agencies like the Election Assistance Commission, like the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, um, and sort of, uh, I don't know, taking advantage of economies of scale to provide more resources and guidance to election officials on the ground who do the real work at the end of the day of interacting with voters, getting them their ballots and counting results. Thank you both. That's really helpful. And I, for the in the sake of time, I'll ask two more questions. So the first one is, what is the role of the press in the election audit process? And what should be the role of the press in this process? And we can start with Derek and then go to Matt for this one. Yeah, I think I would, you know, uh, reiterate the importance of transparency, the importance of uh, people being a part of these processes, watching what's going on, confirming that things are happening according to the pre-written procedures. Um, not everyone can actually do that, you know, as much as we would encourage people to be observers, be poll workers, uh, people have things going on in their life that prevent them from being there in person. Um, it's become more common for these sort of things to, you know, have a webcam available that people could watch what's going on. Um, and that's a great option for some people, but for many others, the media is, is the representative of the public. Um, and I think they should be in the room um, describing what is happening, uh, um, amplifying those messages to the public. Um, and I would encourage members of the media to really talk with election officials before audits and while they're happening to understand what is actually happening. Why are you doing the things that you're doing? 
uh, what are you finding from these processes and why should this give the public confidence in how the election was administered? Yeah, I think that's that's right. Um, I don't have too much to add to that. Uh, perhaps, you know, to phrase it slightly differently uh, from my experience, depending on the state that you're in, um, or I guess uh, how your government operates, the press is often referred to as like the third house of the legislature or the fourth branch of government uh, or the administrative states. So maybe they're the fifth branch of government. Um, but that they have an important role to play in, in the government, in particular when it comes to not just representing um, voters' interests in how the government is run, but in representing the public's interest when the government is functioning as an institution on behalf of the public. And the press does something that largely no, no other institution in America can. Um, and we rely upon them to be, as Derek said, our representatives as people in that scenario. And they can't function without sufficient transparency rules in place. Uh, which is why transparency is so important. The other side of that though, with that access and with that, um, that role that they sit in, there is a responsibility that is placed upon them that they should continue to take seriously, which is um, journalistic ethics, to make sure that before they run in, in, with a story about something that they've done the work to confirm that that is accurate. As Derek mentioned, sitting down with folks doing this work in advance to have a clear picture of what should be expected. If something turns up that isn't expected, to, to dig in as to the why before just rushing to uh, uh, publicize something without context, because I think that can become difficult for uh, the public to, to grapple with, especially in a field that can often be kind of technical uh, like election administration. So they have a, a large responsibility and a large role. Thank you. Yes, I think that's a great point. And the last question would be, what does the public need to understand? Like what is the one main takeaway that individual citizens can take from this event? to understand and evaluate the election process. And then what is the role that individual citizens can play? And I know that you both have alluded to this um, several times throughout the course of, of today's event. And I think Derek in that most recent answer had mentioned election observers. And there was also a question from the audience about what role election observers can play. So I guess just in a general sense, what is a main takeaway for individuals to have from the election audit standpoint? And for this, we can start with Matt and then go to Derek. Sure. So yeah, we mentioned election observers. I'll try to be brief because I know we're running out of time here. Um, but election observers is an important role for the for members of the public to play. Similarly, with, with volunteering to work at your precinct, uh, being involved in the process as much as you can, uh, separate from the kind of partisan electioneering of getting your candidate to win, there's an important role for the public to play in just conducting an election. Uh, and be and I would encourage folks to become a part of that as they can. Um, the second, the, the big to me, the big takeaway of all of this is that. Elections, like any other system that we have, is, is a human institution. It includes human error. Uh, it occasionally includes malicious uh, mis uh, mistakes and actions. Um, so it's, you know, look for them. It's why we have audits. Uh, it's why we have these kinds of procedures, and it's why we build trust. But at the same time, um, be willing to accept the results of an audit and then pick up uh, and, and fight again another day. Uh, if your side lost, it's probably, you know, 99.99% chance that, that the reason is because there were too few people in your jurisdiction supporting your candidate. Um, and if that's the case, then then make more, right? Go out and convince people that your side was right and that your candidate should win. Uh, don't don't gripe about how things turned out the last time. Um, and I'd say, you know, the healthy skepticism, again, on both sides, you should have some skepticism, you shouldn't have too much. Uh, no, I don't think I have too much to add to that. I, I think those are uh, those are great points. Um, and uh, I completely agree with the notion that um, things are going to go wrong in every election. It's impossible for it not to. Again, it's just too big of a logistical undertaking. But it is really important to understand that um, election officials are preparing for that. <laughs> they know that mistakes will happen. And that's why we have these procedures to uh, you know, try to minimize those errors in the first place, but then recover from them, check them, improve in the future. Thank you. Thank you both for all of your expertise today and for sharing all of your thoughts on these important questions and topics. I'm going to turn things over to Steve to give a brief conclusion of today's event. And thank you again to everybody who attended. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. Um, this has been a wealth of useful information, but presented in a very understandable and accessible format. Uh, just like some, some key points that I'm taking away is that as, as noted early in the conversation, there's, there's multiple different kinds of election audits, but ultimately they are about trust in the system um, to ensure that our elections properly reflect the will of the people 
you know, what we're seeing a lot of since 2020 are not so much audits, but partisan reviews, uh, despite a host of evidence to the contrary that the elections are, are being run perfectly well. Um, these partisan reviews are an existential threat to our democracy. And, and one of the red flags to these as an existential threat is to just ask uh, what the goals of its conductors or its proponents are. Are they seeking to get at the truth or seeking a particular electoral outcome? You know, things will go wrong in every election, but that does not mean the will of the people is being undermined. Uh, but for general citizens, one way to help rebuild trust in these in our elections is to get involved as an election observer, as a poll worker uh, in many ways. Um, for, you know, for election officials, showing your work to the, to the public is important, putting into clear words uh, all the things that you can do to get things right. Um, and invite people into the process. The media can talk to election officials before and during audits. You know, these are, elections are a team effort. I think it was stated multiple times. Um, so there are roles for all of us. And I hope we have shined some light today on where you can play a, your role or play a role. Uh, and I hope we've also given you a good foundation to do so. So thank you all for attending. Um, thank you again to the Levin Center for partnering with us on this event, particularly to the team behind the scenes. Uh, they don't get the, uh, thanks as much. Um, thank you to Calder and Dominica for moderating and asking the questions respectively, like those were fantastic. Um, you did a great job. And thank you to our panelists for providing your time and expertise. Like this, this event has gone as well as we could have hoped. Um, and it's a great credit to all of you involved. So, so thank you. And thanks again to everyone for attending.